Today, we will conclude the triad of lectures looking at what has been a key ingredient in multiple lives, which is namely change. And in general, changes that are meaningful, not uh, necessarily through the trauma that may have caused them, and we saw quite a few of those yesterday, but much more significantly in function of how these changes affect our response. Among the changes most benign and frequently encountered are those that occur naturally as part of the inevitable degradation of materials used by artists. The result of such changes can materially alter the look of a picture, oxidized paint in the middle ground of many 17th century pictures undermines the intended sense of recession, and we all know what yellow varnish does to the color blue. Knowing something about the materials of the artist is essential for art historians, lest they draw conclusions that physical evidence will not support. Let me present but one example using two paintings by Vincent van Gogh or Vincent van Gogh or Van Gogh. That's why he signed Vincent. <coughs> it's true, he didn't like the way the French pronounced his name. One can easily imagine looking at this picture and pondering the choice of the artist to paint a blue jacket on a blue background. Is this a bold modernist move? But if you examine the picture very closely in the conservation studio outside its frame, you will immediately see, look all the way to the right of the picture, that uh, this is not a blue puzzle, this is something natural. It's a pronounced change of color. Originally, the background was purple, and under what was the rabbit of the frame, you can still see a little bit of the purple color. The image with the purple background here is, of course, a digital manipulation, but it provides an approximation of what the painting would have looked like before the background changed. The artist, what did he do? He mixed cobalt blue with a very unstable fugitive red lake. The lake faded and the blue alone remained. The reason I refer to the image as an approximation is of course that we can never identify if other pigments may have been used, faded or even darkened. There is certainly a possibility that some changes have taken place in the face, but it is not as evident as it is in the background. Van Gogh would surely have had in mind also the complementary color contrast of the uh, reddish yellow beard and the purple background. The Metz irises by Van Gogh were not painted on a white background. They were painted on a pink one that has also all but disappeared, except for once again traces under the frame's rabbit. And here you see again the reconstruction in both instances, the self-portrait and the irises. The accuracy of uh, this reading of the pigment's fugitive nature is corroborated by the artist's letters to his brother Theo, which refer in the first case to a self-portrait on a purple ground, and in the second, irises against a pink wall. I spoke on an earlier lecture of urban changes due to the effects of modernization. Works of art are not immune to this practice either. It was in the spirit of the late Quattrocento to bring as many works as possible into harmony with the style and manner of the time, and the present example shows just how much this can affect our response and interpretation of some of those works. What happened here is simple and straightforward. Contemporary documents for this work and many others call for reframing them, providing, quote, new ornaments a l'antica, which, this being the age of humanism, means modernization. So in this case, the cusped polyptics were squared up with rectangular frames, the spandrels between were filled, and pilasters in Renaissance style were added, also friezes inspired by the new architectural manner as well. Giotto's polyptic in Bologna gives us some idea of how the Baroncelli altarpiece could also have looked. It might actually have been even more ornate, but we simply don't know anymore. <clears throat> 
Here, there is no question of changing back the Santa Croce altarpiece into a late Gothic one. First, because we don't have the missing parts, but also because the Ghirlandaio reframing represents a legitimate moment in time and in practice in the Renaissance. And for a very long time, it has been an integral part of the look of the church, albeit actually rather anachronistic, being surrounded as you can see here on the screen by Tadeo Gaddi's fresco paintings that are contemporaneous with Giotto and surmounted by a Gothic stained glass window. What saddens me a bit about the chapel as it now looks is that the polyptych was actually painted by Giotto specifically for this spot on that altar. So if it had not been modernized in the Renaissance, we would have a complete and unaltered view into a Florentine chapel of the early Trecento. Now here, looking now at the frescoes themselves, and I ask you to look at the upper left, another issue crops up, and it is one of a conservator's choice of treatment, to wit, not toning the losses in the frescoes to better match the local colors. To me, this is questionable, as our attention is drawn away from the work of art itself, shifting the focus onto the losses. I see no reason why, even if you did not want to paint in details of the composition, the trattegio areas could not be just a bit darker, harmonizing a bit more with the fresco. But there will always be disagreement, as you know, on issues of conservation. As I pointed out, the reframing was not a drastic step, nor did it deface the picture, save for a few small losses. However, to my eye, it has some interesting and paradoxical effects on how we view the Giotto. In the Renaissance frame, even though it is Giotto, by contrast to the fully classicizing manner of the frame, it is of Giotto's late Gothic legacy that we tend to be conscious, whereas in the Gothic frame, it is the reverse. It is Giotto, the proto-Renaissance figure, of which we are more conscious, again, by contrast with the frame. In this other man-made alteration, rather more is at stake. And it is an interesting case also for its implications on possible restoration. This is Duccio's temptation on the mountain at the Frick in New York, as it has looked for about 700 years, ever since it was part of the great Maesta in Siena. You saw the whole, the first lecture, if you were there. In 2007, a technical examination undertaken by the Met, we are charged at the Met with the conservation of the Frick pictures, they don't have a, their own studio, revealed that the two angels, whose oversized presence behind the hills tends to collapse the space and harm the composition, were found to have been added later. Duccio had shown only Satan and Christ against the gold background. In this digital manipulation of the image, we see his far more felicitous composition, where the gold ground assumes an almost spatial presence. We learn that shortly after the panel was delivered, a cleric objected to the absence of angels as described in the scriptures, perhaps even as described as in the contract with Duccio himself, and that the gold was ordered scraped off so that an assistant could add the angels. The angels could have been removed and the gold replaced in the <coughs> Metropolitan Studio. But the decision not to do so was a choice dictated by the fact that the angels were added very early on, possibly even under Duccio's supervision. Had the angels been, let's say, a 19th century edition, I have no doubt that they would have been removed and uh, the gold restored. The case, at some point, I'm going to need water if somebody is be kind enough to get me a glass if that's not too complicated. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, the case of the Berlin panel from the now dispersed Orsini polyptic by Simone Martini of about 1340 is an interesting variant on the previous case. It is the great art historian, the late Roberto Longhi, 
Merci infiniment. He has a more of a French accent than I do. <laughs> <coughs> it is the great art historian, the late Roberto Longhi, who identified all the parts of the altarpiece, thereby confirming what inconsistency of style told us, namely that originally, instead of a landscape, the picture must have had a gold ground. Reconstituting one part of the altarpiece that he identified, we see how compromised is the Berlin panel in its present state with the landscape a jarring anachronism and the picture as a whole largely now a fiction. The clarity and spiritual quality of the otherworldly dimension provided by the gold are lost in this forced naturalism and inconsistent spatial context. One hopes that conservatives in Berlin will seriously consider the issue. It is not only their engagement in the materiality of the object that is at stake here, but their engagement in the emotional expression of the narrative, which is now so diminished. And never mind if you're a curator ever trying to reconstitute in a small dossier exhibition uh, putting the panels together, you could never hang these pictures together as they stand. I hope there's someone from the Berlin Conservation Studio in the room at the moment. Now, the reason the Duccio at the Frick was left unchanged was that the addition of the angels was deemed an important stage in the existence of the picture and one very close to the moment of creation. In the case of the hermaphrodite at the Louvre, no one would think of removing the pillow and the mattress, even though they are Baroque additions to a Roman marble, a typical example of which there are many copies, as you see at the bottom of the screen. And the reason no one would think of removing the pillow and the mattress is for the simple reason that they are by Gian Lorenzo Bernini and therefore a great artist, and therefore you have work of art within a work of art, and you would never dream of changing it. But what if they, the two, the pillow and uh, the uh, mattress, had been the work of, let's say, Cavaceppi and his active studio, uh, who restored so many Roman marbles in the 18th century for his grand tour clients? Probably different museums would have a different approach, but I suspect that a number of them might conceivably uh, remove the mattress and the pillow. This is rendered somewhat more problematic because in this case, uh, an argument for the status quo is that uh, the Bernini version has had a very rich afterlife of its own as his addition it's not really a restoration, it's an addition, spawned a great many replicas, of which I show you one at the upper left, uh, one by Susini. So there are so many echoes and after creations of the work with Bernini that I think it would be problematic to remove it. Perhaps this is a good moment in this context, and as we have two Roman copies after a Greek original, for me to say a word about Roman copies, so plentiful are they and so fixated on forgeries are we in our own time. Roman copies are a form of emulation rather than of deception. They are recreation and translation for avid Roman consumption, but also for the perpetuation of an acknowledged superior manner. Copies were actually regarded at the time as legitimate substitutes for the original. The notion of uniqueness and unreplicability belonging to modern times. An indication of this can be found, for example, in the writings of the second century Roman writer Lucian, who describes copies as Myron's work or Polycletus's work. In other words, the work was understood to reside in the basic form and conception, and these could be copied any number of times by good craftsmen. As Professor Alex Nagel pointed out in Anachronistic Renaissance, the paradox here is that you can actually have works that are 
authentic and yet not original. This is Robert Peake, the Elder's portrait of Henry, Prince of Wales, brother of Charles I, as it arrived at the National Gallery in Washington from Parkham Park for its exhibition on the English country house in 1985. Many country houses lent to the National Gallery with the understanding that they would restore a number of pictures for them. In this case, the work is original, but it is not authentic because it is not as Peak painted it. To start with, it is obviously very dirty. Also, what is the coat of arms doing floating in space in front of the landscape defying gravity? Cleaning revealed that the Prince of Wales had been accompanied by a naked figure of Father Time carrying the horse's own huge feathered hat and the prince's lance and the coat of arms is quite firmly embedded into the brick wall of a building. Perhaps someone thought mistakenly that it was unseeming or unseemly to have a figure reminiscent of death accompanying the prince, who knows. This was a simple case. I ask you now to pay particular attention to a more complicated one. And it is the case of the equestrian portrait uh, I'm sorry, in the case of the equestrian portrait by Peake, only removing overpainting had marred the original. Quite on the contrary, a rather more serious injury was done to an original and extremely fine work of art to achieve the de desired results here, which is representing the marriage of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. You see it here in an old photograph taken before the restoration of the painting. The case is particularly troubling because the painting in question, the original one, which is not what you see on the screen, as you'll see shortly, is actually a major work. <coughs> the painting you have just seen reappears here in an engraving when the picture was the property of Horace Walpole and hung in the long gallery at Strawberry Hill, his Gothic revival villa. According to an inventory of 1797, it was attributed to the Netherlandish painter Jan Hossart, then known as Mabuse. Walpole writes admiringly of this picture in his anecdotes of paintings. That it should have been so well thought of is surprising, given the anachronisms, the inconsistencies, whether in style or in dress, the faulty scale, and much more with which this picture abounds. The melancholy sight in front of you is the picture as it appears today after the removal of the fanciful wedding additions, which alas had not been overpainted, but rather added after the original panel had been brutally scraped down all the way to the underdrawing. It is now one of the few early northern paintings, it's jamais mal sans bien, to show the whole underdrawing to the naked eye. You don't need uh, reflectography. Uh, there it is. Uh, this is meager consolation, I think, for what happened to the picture. And now I will explain a little bit uh, some of the reasons why. In order to accommodate their Protestant patrons, the saints were secularized with obliteration of their attributes. A blue arrow should have now appeared on the lower left. And so if you look carefully, you will see that the new patrons have hidden all but the toes of the saint on the left. And of course, St. John the Baptist has been scraped off to make room for Elizabeth of York. <coughs> Upper right, the figure of St. Jerome became simply a historical bishop with the removal of his red cardinal's hat and the lion at his feet. The crown and the robe of the king were altered. The French flat ring ornamented with fleur de lis was replaced by an English style crown. This actually had been the representation of Saint Louis. Not being a saint anymore, but simply a king, his jaunty pose with leg forward seemed more in tune with a secular figure. 
The virgin and child, who were also not suitable in the center, were removed, leaving the odd, empty architecture in the center toward which the figures are turned. Objects related to the virgin, now it's the arrow looking both ways, such as the glass vase with the columbine and the open censer were also hidden. As for the church interior, it of course has absolutely nothing to do anymore with a 15th century northern painting, but it was probably the work of an early 17th century specialist in church interiors, someone like Peter Naefs, and I've put one of his works on the left. We come now to the question of attribution. Always a very thorny issue, and a particularly thorny issue in early Netherlandish painting. Though there is very little argument in this particular instance as to the quality and the distinction of uh, the picture, that it is by a major master. The majority of scholars seem to think it is by Hugo van der Goes, otherwise known as Hugo van der Goes, others by Gerard David, and then uh, one other scholar, a distinguished person, uh, believes it is the work of Jean A., once called the master of Moulin. Whoever is the author, he is an outstanding artist, and the picture would occupy a place of honor in any gallery. Here let me come to the issue of response. The painting is horribly scarred, but it has somehow acquired an aura that is quite special and oddly seductive. It is due in part to the fact that what is revealed by the scraping is quite a marvelous drawing, a rare thing indeed in such circumstances, and it does, for me at least, make up a little bit for the losses. In fact, I find the picture rather riveting, uh, a magnetic work, and I contemplate it with pleasure and fascination for hours. It is on loan from its private collector to the Met, and I am drawn to it in part and um, perversely by uh, the damage. It is a little bit, if you will, like the fragmentary sculpture of uh, Queen T, this yellow jasper masterpiece of the Amarna period, whose losses we all, I think, compensate for by reifying them in our mind's eye in a kind of mental reconstruction. So too, for the Netherlandish work, we also somehow make the picture whole in our imagination. In this case, uh, to the point where uh, if someone told me that an archaeologist had found the top of the head, I'd be, I'd be rather concerned uh, and perhaps disappointed that it would not live up to the image I will over the years uh, have uh, of what it would have looked like. Now, if rather than painting a whole new picture to depict the marriage of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, an old panel with an existing composition was used by scraping it down in parts, it is that panels were expensive, and in this case, there were already some very fine figures in a suitable arrangement, figures that, with an edit or two, as we saw, could find a new role to play along with the latter-day protagonists, with much less effort, of course, for the new painter and much less expense. If panels were valuable, more so still and rarer was good ivory, and thus they too were often reused. I am showing you just one example with this great ivory of the Metz school of the Carolingian period of the ninth century, which was carved on the back of a consular diptych, a work of some three centuries earlier, which might have looked something like this, like the Anastasius diptych in uh, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale. Such diptychs were essentially writing tablets <coughs> used as gifts or rewards to those who supported the candidature of uh, the consul. The function of the ivory was most likely to serve as a book cover 
which is why the back was planed down, as you saw in the previous slide. Very few such book covers uh, have survived. The ivories tend to be now independent. And the reason is very simple. You melt it down for the nominal value of the metal and for the value of the semi-precious stones. The ivory has gone in our multiple lives from being a secular to a religious work and from the cover of a book for the cult to a work of art in a museum vitrine. This, of course, is not the real cover for the previous ivory. It's an example because the real cover no longer exists. When it comes to reuse, the interest rises, for me at least, when the intention derives not so much from expediency or economics, as we've just seen, but from a political or religious motive. In the first century AD, this cameo was an object of great luxury, intimately tied to the persona of the emperor, whom it celebrated and whom it honored. It might have been on a signet ring or on a pendant, and embodying his heroic and divine nature, the conflation of the two, and these things were exported throughout the empire as items of imperial propaganda. But look at where another Augustus cameo holds center stage, on a crucifix of the Ottonian period. It's called the Lothair Cross. It's a crux gemata because of the semi-precious stones with which it is encrusted. And here we have a case of dual imputed meanings, both with dynastic pretensions, and I'll come to these shortly. First, the cross. It takes its name from the large engraved rock crystal near its base. You can see the arrow, you can't see the rock crystal, I understand that. Uh, it bears the portrait and the name of the Carolingian ruler Lothair, king of Lotharingia, essentially the Western Rhineland, uh, and dating from the 9th century. He is a nephew of Charles the Bald. But it was actually made over a century after Lothair's death for a member of the Ottonian dynasty, the successors of Charlemagne. And what is key in this context is his title. He is the Holy Roman Emperor. So why is a cameo of the Holy of the Roman Emperor Augustus holding an eagle's scepter on a cross? It is there for symbolic reasons, in order to link the Ottonian dynasty with the original Roman emperors, and furthermore, to assert them, the emperors, as God's representatives on earth. The richness of decoration surprises some people expecting a more sober vehicle for the corpus of Christ. But in point of fact, as a reliquary for a fragment of the true cross, nothing was too rich for so precious a relic of the faith. There are texts that clarify this for us. The 12th century abbot of Saint-Denis, Abbot Suget, would describe how whenever he beheld on the altar the wonderful Amirabilem, the jeweled cross of saint Eloi of Eligius, the patron of goldsmiths, he was reminded of a famous passage in Ezekiel. Every precious stone was your covering. In his own texts, Suger refers to the sacred virtues of the gems, referring to their scriptural association, as each corresponded to a particular Christian virtue. There is no chance there in the way it is put together. This allowed them to serve as mediating objects that bridged the physical and the spiritual realms, elevating Suger through the emotion of wonder to a state of ecstatic devotion. The Lothair cross was to acquire yet another life, one to help it harmonize with other objects in a church treasury, such as this chalice. So look at the base of the Lothair cross. It was obviously added in the 15th century, turning the object into a hybrid Ottonian and Gothic reliquary. Here, unlike 
Augustus, with this engraved aquamarine of his daughter Julia, we have a case of misidentification and straightforward reuse, as she was most likely thought to actually be an image of the Virgin. It was given, by the way, to the Abbey of Saint-Denis by Charles the Bald again. And there is an inscription on the gem, but the inscription does refer to Julia. It is actually the inscription in Greek of the maker of the gem. A rather more sophisticated destiny, through reuse, awaited this portrait of the Emperor Caracalla of the early third century with a cross and a Greek inscription added, carved onto it, to make the pagan amethyst in Taglio into a Saint Peter. Here, a precious object is not wasted, and there is no issue, like the Hellenistic heads we saw uh, yesterday, of ridding the gem of the agency of its referent. Moving to our own time, the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei presents a wholly different form of reuse or appropriation or revalorization, or for some, cynical defacement. Urns of this vintage, they're at least seven or 8,000 years old, this is an authentic piece on the left, are usually cherished for their anthropological importance. By employing them as ready-made, I, strips them of one aura of preciousness and grants them another, according to his own system of values. This differs markedly from the Duchamp ready-made, not so much because the alteration is far more drastic. Duchamp merely installed the urinal upside down, but because the urinal itself had no value as art until he placed it in an art context. I's chosen ready-mades already have significance, so he is substituting one kind of value for another, and for many critics today, actually a rather more significant one. A different set of episodes less pregnant with meaning as more decorative and functional, characterizes the checkered life of this simply gorgeous Sung period bluish white porcelain vase with its screamingly genuine imperfection of the bent neck. It is thought actually to be the earliest documented Chinese porcelain object to have reached Europe, and it is now at the National Gallery of Ireland the pride of its Chinese ceramic collection. It has a provenance as distinguished as its artistry and rarity, and it is its first owner, King Louis the Great of Hungary, who, for a time at least, transformed the vase into the hybrid object you're about to see. This must have been shortly after he received it from a Chinese ambassador in 1338. Louis presented it in turn to King Charles I. It later passed into the hands of the Grand Dauphin of France, son of Louis XIV. And after that, it entered the collection of the French connoisseur François de Guénière, who had the print that you see on the upper left made around 1730. It was when later it was owned by William Beckford, and on display at his Gothic-style mansion, Font Hill Abbey, closer to 1800, that the larger display print that you have here was seen. So what we see here is the Sung porcelain standing quite at ease with totally new Gothic mounts in a new life as a ewer, among other treasury objects. The mounts have since been removed. The work is once again a Sung period porcelain, and this time, not a curiosity in a treasury, and later an art collection, but today an artifact in a modern museum in Dublin. Additions and subtractions to works of art can have rather more profound effects on the original intention of patron and artist than this. And our own response, deeper to 
the transformation than the rather incidental nature uh, of the Sung porcelain that just just seen. And in the next example, what you are going to see is both a misreading of a subject and a substantive dislocation. As to the misreading, it was due, I think I'm due also with the slide, it was due to the loss of an attribute, namely the weapon wielded by Samson, a jawbone of an ass, which turned this glorious over life-size marble statue of 1560 by John Bologna, which is one of the treasures of the V&A, from a Samson slaying the Philistine, which it is, for 200 years to a Cain slaying Abel, which it is not. This wrong identification accompanied the sculpture, as I said, for more than 200 years in several inventories and catalogues when it was in the collection of Thomas Worsley at Hovingham Hall and until it entered the V&A in the 1950s. In this case, it is well worth recounting the sculpture's history before it entered the Worsley collection. It was commissioned in 1568 by the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Francesco de' Medici, and like Donatello's David, as well as his Judith and Holofernes in the Medici Palace courtyard, it also served Medician political propaganda. There, a century later, Lorenzo had equated his role as ruler of Florence with that of the biblical figures of David and the earlier one of Judith as saviors and protectors of their people in Florence. Francesco's successor, the Grand Duke Ferdinand, then sent the Samson of Gian Bologna as a gift to the Duke of Lerma, Prime Minister of the King of Spain, who later sent it to Charles I of England, perhaps to encourage a uh, possible Spanish marriage. Now, without losing sight altogether of the Gian Bologna, let me take you on a little trip to the royal palace of Aranjuez, some 20 kilometers south of Madrid, to stroll through its wonderful park. And there you will see this truly majestic marble fountain, a masterpiece of the 16th century, which is crowned by a bronze sculpture, an incongruous, out of scale, and slightly comical bronze Bacchus. Now, if my talks so far have shown anything of value, I hope it is for one that things are not always as they seem, and that we are rarely witnesses to historical truth. So it is that indeed, the marble base and the bronze backers cannot possibly be of the same conception. By now, you don't really need me to tell you what stood atop this splendid marble fountain in Aranjuez. It was, of course, the Gian Bologna Samson slaying the Philistine. It is probably when the Duke of Lerma sent the Samson to Charles I that he left the fountain behind and it found its place in a royal palace. The Samson is therefore no longer the top of a fountain. It is now an independent sculpture group in a private collection and then later in an English museum. I doubt in this particular instance whether any form of diplomacy would be able to reunite the works, but if ever it did, it might not actually be the right thing to do, because in one instance, uh, in the case of Samson, you have a work that has existed entirely indoors, so its finish would be very different from the highly worn marble of the fountain, and the two uh, would make a, a difficult marriage. Nevertheless, I don't want to stop anybody from trying to get it to the V&A. I wish to move now as I approach the end of these three talks to the trials and tribulations of rather more public artworks, architectural in nature or actual architecture as you shall see. The present case study presents interesting reversals of roles and context. <clears throat> 
I referred to the horses of San Marco in their various and dramatic peregrinations, where they moved from one triumphant context to another, until the moment when these became but a memory. The horses generally agreed to be Roman, possibly second century, were taken to Constantinople about 200 years after they were made by the Emperor Constantine. For some 800 years after that, they stood triumphant in the capital of the Byzantine Empire, overlooking the Hippodrome. In 1204, during the Fourth Crusade, Doge Enrico Dandolo captured the city of Constantinople in a bloody and destructive siege, which saw the melting down of an appallingly high number of Greek bronzes to create cannons and coins. The horses were among the very few of the great works of art that somehow were spared. They were brought to Venice and placed not on the facade of the Basilica of San Marco, but in front of the Arsenale to be melted down there. A Florentine ambassador who saw them urged that they not be melted down, but used in some form by the Serenissima to celebrate its triumph over Byzantium of Western over Eastern Christianity. They ended up being hoisted onto the facade of San Marco, where they remained until quite recently. But sometime in the 14th century, uh, no, sometime in the 14th century, in fact, the poet and humanist Petrarch describes them as a reappropriation from an ancient triumph to a new one. It was also noted by a number of other writers at uh, the time. The horses were to leave their perch atop San Marco two more times. The first for another triumphal march, this one in 1798, when they were brought to Paris and mounted on the Arc du Carousel as war booty after Napoleon's first Italian campaign and victories in the Veneto. There, these triumphant marches, by the way, with spoils of war were nothing new and the record of the spoils from the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem on the Arch of Titus is among the best known earlier examples. The horses of San Marco stayed atop the Arc du Carousel only until the Treaty of Vienna of 1815. We've spoken about it a few times. They were sent back to Venice and replaced on the facade of San Marco. That's what you see here, the replacement. The sculptor, François-Joseph Bozio was the one who had the official commission. Uh, he had been the official sculptor to Napoleon to replicate the San Marco horses, and he did so in 1828. Now here what is interesting is that Bozio, even though he enriched the theme of the quadriga, adding a chariot carrying a figure of peace, ended up creating a work of sculpture so closely associated with their Venetian model that, in my view at least, they never really acquired an identity of their own as the work of a French neoclassical sculptor. A glance up toward the top of the Arc du Carousel, and it is the horses of San Marco that are evoked, not Bozio. The meaning at the Carousel is simply very hard to decouple from the history of the equestrian ornament. On the other hand, and paradoxically, it is the genuine horses that ceased being outward symbols of conquest to assume a new role as works of Roman sculpture primarily. And that is when in the 1980s, they were moved indoors, as you see them here, for conservation reasons, as the gilding and the bronze patina were deteriorating badly in the open air. The result, to the eye, is quite simply catastrophic. These look like giant molded chocolate horses covered in tin foil. All notion of triumph has perished with the dreadful simulacra. Before the horses were unceremoniously moved indoors, they actually assumed yet another life, another identity, as protagonists in an exhibition across the ocean at the Metropolitan. There, it was both the art historical context and the romance of Venice that supplanted any sense of triumph or conquest. <laughs> 
Now, moving on to my conclusion, the first of my last three themes reflects an act of God, the next an act of man, and to conclude, I look at a well-known modern instance of the clash between art and life. Who has not been awestruck by the grandeur, the richness, the spiritual aura of this most majestic and vast of churches, San Paolo Fuori le Mura, in Rome? It is impossible not to enter this basilica and have one's breath taken away. Not for a second does one even conceive so pristine does it look, so rich its materials, alabaster columns, malachite and lapis lazuli on the tabernacle, conceive of its early state early in the 19th century. I show you here the only record, a micro mosaic depicting San Paolo Fori le Mura after a devastating fire, which left only the outer walls, the apse, and the mosaics standing. There were only two choices at this point, destroy the remainder of the church and salvage its most precious elements, or reconstruct it as it once was. This, by the way, is a region prone to earthquakes and the ruin would never have survived. Fortunately, there existed many good drawings made of the church over the centuries, enough fragments in the ruins to be certain of a number of architectural details, and especially valuable, a painting of 1750 by Giovanni Paolo Panini, which I have put on the screen and which guided uh, the reconstruction of the basilica. The multiple lives of architectural monuments is of course a field unto itself but I would like to say a few words about it. For one, nowhere is patina so pronounced in mitigating alterations and so strong an equalizer of styles as in architecture, where the actions of time on outdoor stone elements so evenly merges old and new that most people have great difficulty distinguishing one from the other, with the result that over time, the hybridity of most old buildings tends to be accepted as their reality. One consequence of this is that it makes decisions about restoration rather more complex often than in the fine arts. The debate about Violet le Duc's interpretive restorations of medieval monuments, made according to a romantic view of the Gothic or the Romanesque, which we saw yesterday with Notre Dame and the Chimeras, but in the case of Yolet le Duc, I have to say with no intent to deceive, is the debate an ongoing one? Indeed, fanciful as many of these restorations may be, we should be grateful for them, as they did save many great buildings that were approaching ruin and would have crumbled and destroyed, be destroyed otherwise. My one example will be saint Cernin of Toulouse, one of France's largest and finest Romanesque churches, about which there has been much controversy recently. The issue arose when it was realized that serious structural damage began showing up precisely where the church had been restored by Viollet-le-Duc and repairs became mandatory. This brought on a debate on whether or not to use the opportunity to bring the church back to its state before restoration in 1876. Those who wanted it brought back to its quote-unquote origins won. Violet Le Duc was, so to speak, de-restored. The opponents, who only wanted to fix the failing masonry, objected on the grounds that one should not try to suppress the traces of successive states in a living building. There are flaws in both arguments. The de-restoration did not bring back the church to its true original state because that one dated from the 12th century. It only brought it back to what was known in the 15th century. Those are what had survived in the 19th. So it is an arbitrary moment in time to which it was restored. <clears throat> 
As for the advocates of keeping the church as palimpsest, their view was useful, frankly, only to a handful of architectural historians capable of discerning the successive stages of construction and reconstruction. The truth is that whatever restoration is eventually conducted on such buildings, of its multiple lives, you still end up choosing only one. The result is either an interim step or more often several steps in a patchwork of restorations. This is simply a fact of life and unless very precise documents and plans exist, what is created during such restorations is always a form of fiction. A building is a living thing and like the proverbial three ages of man, much as we might like to have it otherwise, they are successive stages subsumed within one body. Although the example of saint sernin and there are so many more, showed that controversy seldom ends with the completion or resolution of an issue, especially when it comes to restoration, I want to conclude now on an even more public and controversial project, as I feel it brings in more acutely than most of the others, the theme of response, which is so integral to the work of art as active agent, and which I could only allude to intermittently in these talks. In 1981, artist Richard Serra installed his sculpture, Tilted Ark, in Federal Plaza in New York City, thoroughly drowned underwater in the last uh, episode in New York. It had been commissioned by the Arts and Architecture Program of the US General Services Administration, which earmarked 0.5% of a federal building's cost for artwork. Tilted Ark is a curving wall of raw steel. It is 120 feet long, it is 12 feet high, and it carves the space of the Federal Plaza in half, just about. Those working in surrounding buildings must circumvent its enormous bulk as they go through the plaza. According to Serra, and this is his point, I quote him, the viewer becomes aware of himself and of his movement. I suppose he meant his or hers and of his movement uh, through the plaza. As he moves, the sculpture changes. Contraction and expansion of the sculpture result from the viewer's movement. Step by step, the perception not only of the sculpture, but of the entire environment changes." End of Sarah's quote. The sculpture generated controversy as soon as it was erected. And a New York judge began a letter writing campaign to have the work removed. Four years later, the GSA, that's the General Services Administration, decided to hold a public hearing to determine whether Tilted Ark should be relocated. Richard Serra testified that the sculpture was site-specific and that to remove it from its site was to destroy it. If the sculpture were to be relocated, he would remove his name from it. The art establishment, artists, museum curators, art critics, testified that Tilted Art was a great work of art and should remain in place. Those against the sculpture, for the most part people who worked at the Federal Plaza, said that the sculpture interfered with public use of the plaza. They also accused it of attracting graffiti, rats, terrorists who might use it as a blasting wall for bombs. <laughs> A jury of four, uh, five voted four to one in favor of removing the sculpture. Sarah's appeal of the ruling failed, and on March 15, 1989, during the night, federal workers, they owned it, removed Tilted Ark from Federal Plaza and carted it off to a scrap metal yard where it remains today. It can be recovered if one wants to. The Tilted Ark decision prompted questions about public art about the role of government, funding, of an artist's rights to his or her work, the role of the public in determining the value of a work of art, and whether public art should be judged by popularity alone. Sarah's career continues to flourish despite the controversy. I quote him one more time, I don't think it is the function of art to be pleasing, he commented at the time, 
Art is not democratic, it is not for the people, end of quote. It should be noted here that the arguments against tilted art were not of an aesthetic nature. Few were concerned with whether or not it was a good work of art. For the opponents, it was not just colossal, but a colossal inconvenience, ruining lines of sight and causing them to make a huge detour on the plaza to get to their offices, and especially irksome in the cold and in the rain. It isn't as if successful site-specific sculptures by Serra do not exist. And by successful, I mean simply things that work. There are many. This is one at the bottom of a winding outdoor uh, set of steps in the Louisiana Museum in Copenhagen. It is a dramatic and effective work which does stop you in your tracks, so arresting is it but it does not cause you to retrace your steps to keep moving forward. Now, in the light of what you have heard in these three lectures, when you have seen the multitude of alterations, injurious actions or simply displacements that constitute the many lives of works of art around the world, would you be prepared to argue today that unlike the Luxor Obelisk, the Colonne Vendôme, El Greco's Assumption, or the Heads of Notre Dame, Tilted Arc absolutely had to remain on the plaza as installed by the artist. If but a few of you in this case do hesitate before answering, where you might otherwise have been categorical in your view, then I feel I've achieved my goal in these lectures. Thank you very much.